we're so concerned that we don't want to be disliked. We don't want to ruffle the feathers. But imagine Gandhi thinking that. Imagine Mandela thinking that. Imagine Martin Luther King thinking that. Oh, we don't want to disturb anybody. We don't want to challenge anybody. We just want to leave the status quo the way it is. No positive change can happen. And there are, there are measurable problems right now, environmental problems, social problems, organizational problems. Who's going to fix them if people are not even prepared to talk about them? Our guest for today is Ron Malhotra. Now, Ron is an award-winning health planner, influence, and success expert. He's an author of five books, including a number one Amazon bestseller. His latest book is Impossible to Fail, which we'll certainly talk about in this episode. He's an international public speaker who speaks extensively on success, influence, business, and money. He's also a founder of the successful Mail and Managing Director of Maple Tree Wealth Management. Thank you for doing this, Sean. Welcome to The 20s Show. It's a pleasure. You're doing such good work. And uh, it's an honor to be a part of it and make a contribution to the work that you're doing. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Ron. Appreciate it. So, wow, Ron, you've got so much on your plate. And like, it certainly you've conquered a lot of mountains in your life. And if I'm not wrong, you moved to Australia from India. You were born in India and you moved to Australia when you were young. And uh, ever since then, tell us about what your journey has been so far that has led you to being the person that you are today, who is very passionate about educating and empowering other people about wealth, about success, about life in general. Can you just... Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. And I think it's a great way to start because... I was probably the person with the least amount of success, the least amount of influence and the least amount of wealth. And there is a saying that sometimes the things that you perceive to be missing the most in your life become your primary values in life. Sometimes it happens. And so uh, I was a massive underachiever. Uh, I was born in India and uh, my parents are very good people, uh, God loving people, uh, educated people. Uh, but I saw that uh, as my parents got older, they really struggled. Uh, financially, they struggled. They struggled with health. And it wasn't just them. I saw a lot of good people around them uh, who did all the right things. They were good people and they all struggled. Uh, most of the people that I know in my family, as well as my uh, dad's friends and mom's friends, I saw all of them. None of them were achieving and the goals that they wanted. None of them were living an amazing life. None of them have had an amazing lifestyle. Most of them were hand to mouth at survival. Uh, and it started to dawn on me that uh, you can be educated and still not be able to design the life and lifestyle that you want. So when I was young, this was just an unconscious thought. And uh, when we when we migrated to Australia, it, uh, you know, I, um, I had some, uh, I wasn't getting along with my family. I was a rebellious teen and uh, I was having a lot of conflict with my family. So I decided to leave home and I thought I'm going to go and live with some friends. I'll make some friends and I will show everybody how successful I am. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So I moved in uh, with five guys that I met and uh, it was a horrible time of my life. Uh, I had no money to eat. I, we were literally, I was having a banana for dinner. That was the only thing I could afford. And the guys that I was living with ended up uh, not just doing drugs, but dealing drugs. Uh, one day I came home and I saw a fleet of police cars parked outside the street. Uh, I, I, as I walked uh, to the house, the police said to me, is your name Ron? I said, yes. Uh, they said, we found drugs in your room. I said, they're not mine. Uh, they asked me, who, who do you think, who do the drugs belong to? And I said, it belongs to these guys. They uh, consume drugs and they sell drugs. Uh, the police said, thank you very much. We believe you. Uh, and they left. What followed after that was 20 minutes of brutal bashing. I was brutally bashed up by those guys for 20 minutes. As I lay on the floor, I was mm. kicked. I had dumbbells thrown on me. And I remember just getting up and I walked up to the mirror and I looked at myself. I couldn't recognize my face. My face was swollen. It was bloody. It was dirty. 
Uh, I felt like crying, but I had nobody to speak to. I didn't want to ring my, my family. I, I had really had no real friends. And I think that's when I really hit rock bottom. And I realized that I neither did I have any money. I had no confidence. I had no education. And here I was working at the supermarket, packing bags, packing fruit and vegetables, just so that I could bring some money to pay the rent. And I thought that these people were my friends. And I realized I had absolutely nothing. I had no peace of mind. I did not have good health. I had no meaningful relationships. I did not have meaningful work and I had no financial security. That's when I realized that I had no idea about life. Now, at that point, even though I felt defeated, I decided that I was not going to let this event defeat me. I moved out from that house and I rented a very small apartment, which was a studio apartment. It was the only thing I could afford. Uh, the bedroom and the kitchen and the lounge room, all everything was in one. And I decided that I was going to get out of this situation. And at that point, I realized that lack of money means lack of options. And I had seen it mm. with my parents. I had seen it with their family members. And I didn't want to be another person without money. So I started, I became obsessed with wanting to make money. I absolutely decided that no matter what, I was going to become financially wealthy. So I thought the most um, logical thing I can do is to get a job at a bank so I can understand how money works. And so my first job, uh, I don't know how old you are, Vidan, but I was 20, I, I think I was 19 when I got my first job at a bank. Okay. And uh, at that point, I had no formal education. Sorry? I'm 23, by the way. 23, okay. So younger than you, I got my first job at the bank and my job was to count cash. So I used to be behind the counter and my job was to count cash. But every single day, there would be more cash in the till. And so the staff members were always concerned and say, how come you always have more money? And my response was, well, that's not a bad thing. At least I have more money. I'm not losing money. And they said, no, because if you have more money, there is something going wrong. You're doing some miscalculations. So they said, look, we are sick and tired of staying back and helping you count money. Why don't you go and stand at the door and say hello to people until we work out what we're going to do with you? So as people walked in, the customers walked into the branch, I would start talking to them. I'd say, hi, how's it going? Why are you here? How can I help you? And I started to find out more about them. And I learned a lot about money because there was a lot of wealthy people coming into the bank. And I, had a very, I was very curious. I wanted to know. So I was asking them questions. Instead of helping them, they were helping me. One day, a regional manager walked into the branch and he saw how good I was at talking to people. He asked me, he called me. He said, what's your name? I told him my name. He said, would you like to be a financial advisor? I said, of course. So well, he, he put me through six months of training and I became the first financial advisor. I told my dad, I said, dad, I'm a financial advisor. And my dad said, but you broke. How can you advise people on money? <laughs> now, at that point, I was just so excited that I had been given a position and I really wanted to prove myself. But over the next 18 months, I failed miserably. I did not understand money. I did not understand wealth. Here I was being given the position to advise people on their money, but I didn't understand money myself. And all the training that they had done was to, for me to sell financial products, not to give advice, mm -hmm. right? So this is how my journey started. And anyway, long story short, by the time I was 31, I did very well, even though I failed in my first and second role, my third role, fourth role, and fifth role in, in the world of financial services, I did extremely well. I worked in funds management, private banking, wealth management, and I acquired all the skills around money. But not only did I acquire those skills, I became a very successful investor. And by the time I was 31, I had acquired a few million dollars worth of assets. But I was doing well from everybody's definition. Mm -hmm. But there was a problem. I was coming home. And I was always feeling angry. And I was always having arguments with my wife. I was driving nice European cars. I was wearing Swiss watches. I was wearing expensive suits. I had a beautiful home. But every day I would come home and I would have fight with my wife. I had headaches every Friday night. And I felt depressed. I didn't know what, what was wrong. I thought, I'm doing very well. I have a great position in a private bank. I'm making very good money. I have also become financially smart to be make, able to make investments. Why am I feeling this way? I couldn't understand it. And then somebody suggested to me that I maybe should get a coach or a mentor. So my first mentor I got at the age of 31, and I remember he was an old man and he said to me, who are you? 
And when he asked me, who are you? I said, uh, I gave him my name. And he said, no, 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 I didn't ask you your name. I asked you who you are. So I said, what do you mean who I am? Like, you want to know my nationality? You want to know my culture? You want to know my religion? He said, no, I want to know who you are. So I said, you want to know my occupation? He said, no. He said, tell me this. Did you pick your name? Did you pick your religion? Did you pick your nationality? Did you pick your culture? Did you even pick your occupation? Or was it influenced by external factors? Now, it was the first time I realized at the age of 31 that I had no idea who I was. I had no sense of identity, real sense of identity. At the age of 31, here I was. Everybody thought I was successful. I felt miserable. I only thing that I had was career success and money, but nothing else. No alignment, no clarity, and no real confidence. So my real education started at the age of 31. Even though I had acquired a, a degree and uh, had formal education, I did not feel educated. So my real education started at the age of 31, and I'm 43 now. So it's been 12 years of having mentors to become the man that I've become today. And so you can see that's why a lot of my stuff around social media challenges the traditional education system because I am convinced that the traditional education system does not teach you the three most important elements that an individual needs to learn and master to achieve success in their life and to be able to design the lifestyle that they truly want. The three things that you need to learn and master, the education system does not teach. And, and hence, first, mastery of self. Most people mm -hmm. don't know who they are. They don't know what their purpose is. They don't know what their passion is. They don't know what their values are. They don't know what their strengths are. They don't know right. their mission. They don't have goals. They don't know what their zone of genius is. They don't know how their emotions work. They don't know how their mind works. Right. Imagine, imagine having all these degrees and not knowing anything about yourself. Right. We don't have to imagine. That's reality. That's, a, that's the biggest pandemic in the world is hundreds of millions of people, so-called what I call educated people. They call, edu they call them educated. In my new book, which is called Indoctrinated, which is my seventh book that comes out later this year, okay. I call it, I've come, coined a term called the intellectual idiot. I used to be one of those. Mm -hmm. The intellectual idiot is a person who knows how to carry out a technical task but practically doesn't know anything about themselves, which is the first element, mastery of self. Second element is mastery of business and financial fundamentals. Because we live in an economic world and the entire economic system is based around supporting capitalists and investors. So all of the education that a person needs to be able to design the lifestyle that they want, which obviously requires the ability to make a lot of money, keep money and multiply money is completely, conveniently removed from the educational curriculum systems. Mm -hmm. You think that's a coincidence? And third, the mastery of spiritual fundamentals. To actually understand the, our, our energetic nature, our vibrational frequency, and understanding our connection with the world and connection with others, which is what makes us a human being, which is what differentiates from other animals, this is also not taught. So there's a lot of educational indoctrination going on in the world, a lot of religious indoctrination going on in the world, a lot of media indoctrination, cultural indoctrination going on in the world, which is why young people back then when I was young and people in your generation are confused and lost. They have no idea who they are. They have no idea what they want and they have no idea how to get it. Mm. So this is why I have been on a quest of tackling this massive ignorance problem but you know the biggest challenge is? The biggest challenge is this, that all the people who are ignorant believe that they're educated. Mm -hmm. And this is the biggest problem we're dealing with. You see, when a person knows that they're ignorant, they will seek out solutions and they will seek out wisdom to get educated. When a person believes they're educated, but they're not, how do you convince them? They don't even know there is a problem. Why will they seek a solution? Absolutely. very well put Ron you've articulated it so well and you 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 know when I watch your content when I read your tweets when I read your articles you almost seem like someone who is fighting and not fighting with us you're fighting for us 
it almost seems like you're angry and you radiate such powerful energy that you really want to be changing things how they're happening and how they happen to you and so you want them to not happen to other people it's almost like you're trying to solve a problem that you wish you didn't have to go through very good observation by the way and thank you for pointing it out i am a fighter and oh, yeah. i have never tried to deny that i fight for things that need to be changed people say well why do you fight i said number one i like to fight i'm a warrior inside i know it i feel it second of all there are things that need to be fought for and most people will not fight because most people are comfortable and most people believe that harmony must be maintained at any cost even though research tells us that there is more social value in honest disharmony than there is in dishonest harmony oh, wow. so i'm not i'm very clear on who i am and this is a part of the education that i have gone through i realize i'm not here to please people i'm not even here to be liked i'm here on a quest for the truth and i'm here to make a change and impact that i want to make with my lifetime and i'm fully committed to it i get we get you know i had recently put up a post and my marketing guy rang me he said why did you put that post i said why he said you had 350 people unfollow you he said delete it i said no i'm not deleting it that's i mean it i mean what is the point of me being popular for who i'm not right so the true mm-hmm. test is have you got the courage to stand for what you actually believe and what happens is something amazing happens yes i don't i may not be huge in terms of popularity but i can tell you the people who follow and engage and stay at least they like me for the right reasons they don't like the fake ron they like the real ron and that's a huge compliment to me even if there was one person who liked the real version of me that's a huge compliment what is the point of having a million people like me for the fake version of me right. so you know and the thing is things have to be said we are so con- concerned as we're so concerned that we don't want to be disliked we don't want to ruffle the feathers but imagine gandhi thinking that imagine mandela thinking that imagine martin luther king thinking that oh we don't want to disturb anybody we don't want to challenge anybody we just want to leave the status quo the way it is no positive change can happen and there are there are measurable problems right now environmental problems social problems organizational problems who's going to fix them if people are not even prepared to talk about them and the other issue is that our culture when i talk about our culture and this is not just culture in india but culture in different parts of the world what the culture does is to silence the voices of people who want to talk which is not right because the moment you take away people's expressions you know their their freedom of expression their freedom of speech you're basically taking away their basic right right so and that happens a lot in india you know people don't want to talk about it because oh my god everyone's going to get disturbed but you know what there is no positive change that can happen if people stay quiet because there is a saying when good people do nothing evil flourishes mm. i had a friend of mine she's in india and she sent me a message a couple of days ago and she said i feel like crying i said what happened and she sent me an article of a little girl that was raped in india she said i don't understand how people can do this so i said to her i said do you know despite india's spiritual roots are you aware of the fact that india does not even rate in the top 100 of the most conscious nations in the world no oh, i didn't know that despite its spiritual roots how does that happen because because the whole idea of spirituality and the whole idea of religion is to seek oneness and to seek wisdom and to seek evolution the moment religion or culture stifles that you have gone from seeking wisdom to indoctrination now there is control and wherever there is control there is fear okay wherever all need mm, for control comes absolutely. from fear absolutely so when you have a fear based culture you have a fear based religion you have a fear based consciousness in a country the country cannot evolve people cannot evolve because fear is a bad vibrational energy okay the need to control kids the need to control students the need the need for control always comes from fear right okay. so right. and that's one of the things you know i've come from being born in india and you know um 
Am I, and, and this is what happens. Every time I talk about these things, people say, we don't want the Western values. I said, excuse me, why do you think that this is Western value? This is a value of freedom of expression. This is a value of growth. That's universal to all human beings across the world. This is not a Western value. Agreed. In fact, there's a lot of people in the Western world that are also indoctrinated. So it's not about a country or culture. But the thing is, because my roots come from India, and I see the fact that there are so many young people and I, we get hundreds of messages, young people saying, Ron, what, I don't know what to do with my life. Ron, my parents are controlling me. Ron, I have, I'm, my partner doesn't allow me to get on social media. Control, 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 control. What the hell? Like, how are these people going to ever evolve if you don't even allow them to grow? There is so much control at the government level, economic level, corporation level, media level, cultural level, educational level. So, you know, like, if you just imagine, there is no flexibility, there is no room to make mistakes, there is no room to question anything. And that's exactly what indoctrination is about. That's not education. It's the opposite of education. The, in fact, the word education is derived from the Latin word educo, which means to draw from within. But no one's allowed to draw from within. Everybody oh. has to follow the same rules. Say. So, you know, and that's why I like people, you know, I have real appreciation and respect for people like you, the young people who are now starting to go, hey, mommy, daddy, teachers, not everybody wants to be a doctor, lawyer, an IT consultant or a management consultant. Some of us actually want to do something that's a bit more meaningful and not driven by the need for security, which also comes from fear, okay. right? And we're okay. starting to see that change. I think yours is probably the first generation that's driving that change. And I think so, majority too. people, yeah. And majority of people who are even aware of this are your generation. I'm obviously, you know, I'm older now, but I'm still a fighter. Definitely, I've still got uh, that energy of a young 20 year old, you know what I mean? Definitely. So, Ron, I've got a few questions out there. Firstly, I would say that you've put out such a good point, the courage to be disliked. You put out your truth, honestly, and uh, you put it out without sugarcoating it. Whereas when I have to put out the truth, the thoughts of myself, I haven't allowed myself the freedom to have the courage to be disliked. I try and sugarcoat things and try to put them out in a way that people don't get defensive and uh, absorb the value. So I, in that sense, you have allowed yourself the courage, the freedom to be disliked and to be completely vulnerable, completely open about your own thoughts. And you also mentioned that you've uh, read Nelson Mandela, you've read about Mahatma Gandhi. So has this courage to be disliked and to be comfortably you came out of reading autobiographies of these people? Look, I, it's, it's not that I like being disliked. I mean, who, nobody likes being no, disliked. Right, right, I, right. I, as, a, as a human being, even I like being liked. But the mm -hmm. thing is, the main thing that I have learned by uh, reading the, the, you know, how these people, because Gandhi was a person who, when he started his movement, he only had two or three people by his side mm -hmm. to eventually then leading 200 million plus people and being able to influence them to work with him, you have one human being who has now created a massive movement. How do you do it? The first, uh, the quality of, of a great leader, which is what I aspire to be. You know, my whole, I'm driven by how do I become a high character leader? Is, is, the, is the, you don't think about yourself. You see yourself as the vessel for change. The moment we are thinking about being liked, where is the focus? It's on us. It's no longer on the change. Me, my need to be liked and validated and acknowledged and accepted now has become greater than my need to make a change. Okay. So the moment, the where is the focus now? You've gone from the outward focus. I don't like this. I want to change this. Somebody needs to fix this. I'm going to fix this. Oh, but what are they going to think about me? Now you've gone from vision to fear. That's the problem, right? And from fear, you cannot create. From fear, you cannot inspire. From, from fear, you cannot lead. So courage is the fundamental quality that I've always, I've always believed that that's above all every quality. I have to first master courage. Now, by the way, there is nothing wrong in being considerate about other people's needs as you're being. In fact, what you're doing is you're demonstrating empathy. You are demonstrating a level of kindness by giving consideration to how other people would feel if you were to be extremely blunt. That's, it's a very respectable quality. 
So why? So what is the problem with that? Well, the problem is people do not change unless they feel a significant emotional impact. Mm. Okay. So even though your intentions are good for you and your reputation, and they feel good in the short term, the question is, do they get transformed in the long term? No, they don't, because they feel nothing. You know, why is it that somebody, you tell somebody, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke. They keep smoking, keep smoking until the doctor says, look, you've got emphysema. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, emotional impact, negative emotional impact, the person gives up. Same thing. They keep spending money, keep spending money, keep spending money. And then somebody tells them, look, you're going to go bankrupt. A lot of people then change habit at that point. Because right. even though the emotional impact may be felt negatively in the short term, in the long term, it has a positive impact in many cases. Right. So I'm not here to offend people. I'm here to challenge people. Number one, if you have been, your beliefs have never been challenged. How do you know what you believe is the truth? Somebody's right. got to challenge it. And do I do it because I want you to think I'm amazing? Or do I do it because I want you to think you're, you are not a, a smart person? No, I do it because I want people to evolve because until society evolves, we're going to continue to get this type of stuff in the newspapers where a five-year-old five -year girl is being gang raped because who does that sort of stuff? People who are unconscious. And now right. when you have millions and millions and millions of people who are acting out of fear, you are now creating what we call mass unconsciousness. You have a quantum field of negative energies everywhere. So why is it that India, despite the fact that we, you know, India has got such a young population, you know, 650 million people under the age of 35 or something like that. Everyone's supposedly educated. Everyone supposedly speaks English. Everyone supposedly has the internet. Well, a lot of people do, right? At least the urban people do. Right, right. How come India does not even rank in the top 100 of the conscious nations of the world? And out of all the billionaires in the world, you have India's got a population, like just to give you some sort of an idea, you look at all the millionaires in the world, because people might say it's not about the money, but yes, it is because money is a byproduct of how much value you add in the marketplace. So you look at the number of millionaires in the world, there are 15 million, 500,000 individuals in the world who are considered to be millionaires. As a proportion of the world population, it's not even half a percent. So not even 1% of the global population become millionaires. Now, India itself is what one fifth of the world population. Why isn't it producing for a spiritually evolved, highly educated country? How come there's like only 1.5 million millionaires in India? America alone has 19 million. Sorry, not 19 million, a bigger part, 19 million people that have a net worth of 750,000 plus. Okay. But India, uh, America has got the highest number of millionaires in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm not saying that America is more conscious than India. That's not my point. My point is right now, if you look at India as a nation that wants to evolve and it wants its young people to do well, and you want the next generation of leaders and innovators and disruptors and inventors and creators to come out of India, the cultural energy has to change and nobody's prepared to challenge it because everybody's afraid and everybody wants to be liked, but that's not how you cause a social change. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. I completely respect your, you know, your, you wanting to make sure that people are not disturbed. But the thing is, there is a thing called a first level consequence and a seven le second level consequence. If the first level consequence feels comfortable, the second level consequence may feel uncomfortable. Meaning that I'd rather have the first level consequence be uncomfortable for people so that the second level consequence can be comfortable. Meaning that let me disturb you now. Let me wake you up now. You get a shock now, you have a sleepless night now, but guess what? Now you're so disturbed, you change your behaviors and in 10 years, you reap the rewards. Okay. So my, that's my intent. It's to make a positive change. My approach is unconventional, but it works. That's uniquely, that's uniquely what I like about you. That st makes you stand out of the, a lot of people who are delivering motivational things and who are delivering their truths, but what you do really works and without the hesitation of having the fear of being disliked. So 
that's something very i i definitely admire that and i really wanted to know the mindset that goes behind it so well i on, never i never thought that mm-hmm. i would never thought we'd have 135 million plus views on social media across our platforms and even linkedin i never wow. thought wow. even 10 people would ever like me or follow me but then i realized my god the world is changing clearly a lot of people mm-hmm. do appreciate the truth and the directness never expected that that many people would ever compliment me or respect me or like me um i was going to do it anyway but the fact that people yeah. have given me that support is very encouraging for me i go you know what things are changing that's very encouraging for me people are no longer wanting sugar coated things they want the truth right. even if it's brutal they'd rather know the truth now because ignorance hurts in the long term right genuine and raw it as people want it right now right so uh, ron so. you yeah you you talk about fear right fear is such like i in the words of steven pressfield it's the our number one enemy is resistance and it comes in the form of fear it comes in the form of procrastination and so how do you think people can break out of their fears like uh, i had this massive fear of public speaking and deep down i know i could have been so i now seem to think that fears are the guiding factors wherein anything that makes you fearful i just have to like see them as landmines okay i am being fearful of this let's just step on it and see how it blows off and what uh, i uh, it'll eventually shake my beliefs and then i'll form new beliefs that okay what i thought was a scary act is something that i am emotionally connected with and i have a greater chance of growing in it so that's how i was able to overcome my fear of public speaking i just tried i joined toastmasters club and so now i know that i have to chase fears whatever the fear i have and so how would you suggest people to break free from their fears well my my belief is that if you're ever going to solve a problem you have to understand the cause of the problem first mm-hmm. okay you can never Explain solve that. a problem until you understand the cause because if you don't understand the cause you will fix the symptom but you can't fix the problem which is why a lot of people go to motivational lectures they will listen to the, they read the books they watch the youtube videos and there's no change the reason is they have not identified the cause of the problem so we have so the cause of fear is always ignorance always something you don't understand think about it right how confident and courageous are we to try something when we know something for example if you know how to ride a bike you have the courage to ride a bike but when you don't know how to ride the bike you feel fear whether it's driving a car if you're experienced in going out by yourself and meeting new people you have less fear if you if you if you don't have it you, you know you don't do it so it's the first problem that you want to tackle is this fear and that can only be solved through acquisition of wisdom not by acquisition of information a lot of the information out there is not really wisdom because it's not rooted in time tested proven fundamentals so one of the things that i did was i educated myself on how things work how does life work how do i work how does my mind work how do my emotions work how do people work how relationships work how does business work how does influence work how does money work how does spirituality work what does spirituality even mean what does money even mean what does business even mean so i go into the absolute basics of everything right so the fact that we have multiple businesses and brands i have no fear in business why because i understand the fundamentals of business i have no fear of anything now because i understand the fundamentals i always go to the grassroots level and try and understand everything for example everyone's talking about wealth these days it's trendy to talk about wealth on social media everyone seems to be an expert on bitcoin or forex trading or uh, value investing or whatever it is you ask majority of people how do you even define wealth and they will not be able to tell you it okay. starts there most people don't even know how their own mind works our mind doesn't work the way we think it works and fundamentally because of a misunderstanding of how our mind works the entire education system has been built upon developing the intellectual mind but not the intuitive and the imaginative mind all of the problems in the world stem from ignorance and here is the thing today we have more access to more information than ever before but now we have the reverse problem where do you start you type in the word wealth creation in google and 50 million results come up where do you start now right that's why you've always got to go back to the fundamentals the proven fundamentals as an example what does wealth mean financial wealth 
Wealth is the ability for an individual to create the life and lifestyle that they want without having to work. So until you have to work, you're not wealthy. If you choose to work, you're wealthy because if you don't have to work and you can retire, for example, I don't have to work. If I decided that I don't want to work from today, I have set myself in a way that I could retire, but I choose to work and I will choose to work till the day I die. Right. Okay. So we have to understand this. And the other thing is, how do you become wealthy? There are only two ways. There are only two ways to become wealthy. How many people do you even understand that? So the issue that happens is when people don't understand the basics, they try and get fancy. Oh, I'm going to buy this stock. I'm going to buy Tesla. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to... That's not how you become wealthy. I mean, if that's, that's how you became wealthy, then everybody would become wealthy. It's so easy to buy stocks. Yeah. So when we don't understand, and the, one of the issue, one of the reasons why the ignorance exists is because as I, and I'm making a case in my new book, Indoctrinated, Indoctrinated, and then the in brackets, the subtitle is how the education system perpetuates uh, mediocrity, uh, conformity, and indistinguishability. So I'm making an entire case for how deliberately you have taken out money education, business education, capitalist education, spiritual education, self-education out of the curriculum. What are you teaching the kids? Logarithms, geography, mm -hmm. biology? Fine, you can teach that, but that should be secondary. That can't be primary education. It's, most of it's not applied by people. And you're talking to somebody who's done an executive MBA degree. What did it teach me about running a business? Probably 5% of everything that I have learned about running a business came from the MBA degree. 95% came from mentors and experience. So we have to start to challenge the way the education system is working. And the ignorance is one of the reasons for fear. Because think about how confident you are at attempting something when you don't have fear. Right. When you understand how things work, you will be happy to drive a car because you don't have ignorance about driving a car. You understand how the gearbox works. You understand how the accelerator works. You understand how the brakes work. Now you have less ignorance, so you drive a car. Wherever we have ignorance, we have high fear. And that eventually... Because our mental habits reside in the subconscious mind, as we continue to do the same thing over and over and over again, that becomes a habit. Then the mind automatically does it. You get up in the morning and you feel fear for no damn reason. There's no logical reason. But now you've got yeah. a mental habit. So then the mind produces its own thinking and its own feeling. And then the person becomes a slave to the mind, which is why in every scripture of the world, they have talked about mind mastery. Mind makes a fantastic servant, but a terrible master. So that's why we have to teach young people from the beginning how to what, how their mind works. I mean, I have an eight-year-old daughter. My daughter can explain to my mother-in-law how the mind works well, because we have well. sat down and I say, yeah, because she understands. She says, this is my mind. And I have told her, I said, never, ever say anything about yourself that you don't want to come true. And she said, why? But if I said it, it's going to happen, I said, not if you say it once. Not if you say it twice, not if you say, but you engage with any thought repetitively, eventually gets embedded into your subconscious mind. Subconscious. Once it's accepted by the subconscious mind, it will make alterations to your physiology, your behaviors, so that the concept that's in your subconscious mind and your behaviors start to align. Okay. You will then become that person, good okay. or bad. So we have to teach, and young kids are not taught. They're thinking all kinds of things. I see young guys have reached out to me, gone, Ron, I'm addicted to pornography. And they're helpless. They re literally cannot control themselves. They are addicted to the device. I use the device as a producer, not as a consumer. I mm. control what it's going to do. It doesn't control me. And the reason is very simple. I understand how my mind works. So I will not allow something like this to get inside the part of my mind where I can be controlled. But other people have no filters. They have nothing to block this stuff. So okay. what they do is they get up in the morning, they watch the news, they listen to the negative parents and their negative friends, they listen to the negative media. All of this every single day becomes a part of the subconscious core and then fear becomes a natural habit. That's brilliant articulation, Ron. So tell me, how does one master money? Well, the first thing is I have developed a model called SISPIP. SISPIP, okay? I'm going to S-I-S-P-I-P. -S -S and the first thing I say to people is it's, it's what I call the wealth creation sequence. 
the first element, if you're ever going to create wealth, the first problem you have to solve is the skills problem. Okay. And we're not talking about skills that allow you to do a job. We're talking about skills that are in high demand and are transferable across different industries. That's the first problem you have to solve. Once you can solve that problem of acquiring skills that are in high demand and transferable, you can then influence your income, which is the I. Okay, because until you can influence your income, you can't create wealth. If your boss influences your income, if the company that you work for influences your income and you have very little control of your income, you can't create wealth. You've got a problem already. So the okay. second problem after solving the skills problem is you have to have the ability to influence your income. The third, which is the S in SysPip, is savings. You always want to save six to 12 months worth of your income in savings. Why? Because there are going to be emergencies. You will get sick. The washing machine's going to blow up. Something's going to go wrong. You might even lose your job at some point. So you want to have some cash reserves. Six to 12 months worth of your income, depending on the industry that you work in. If you work in a very volatile industry, you want to have 12 months worth of your income in savings. If you're in a very safe industry, you want to have about six months worth of your income in savings. So now you've skills, income, savings. Now the fourth one is protection. What that means is, for example, I have protected everything that I have. My income, all of my assets and my family. Everything has been protected through a proper risk management plan and insurance plan. If I get mm -hmm. sick, I get paid. If I become disabled, I get paid. If I die, my family gets paid. If I have a heart attack, I get paid. Whatever, if I have a car accident, I get paid. I don't have to sell down any of my assets. My legacy continues. So the fourth part is protection. Fifth part is investing. You see, we don't even invest until you've done the four, first four pillars because you start to invest first which is what everybody does, right? Oh, I'm just going to run. Where should I invest? No, the question isn't where should you invest? The question is, should you invest right now? Yeah. Right. And for most people, the answer is no, you shouldn't because you have not taken care of the basic fundamentals. First, you here trying to build the third level, fourth level of a building without building the foundations. No wonder, no wonder majority of people in the world are poor. Majority of people in the world are poor. 4 billion people have a net worth of less than $1,000. 4 billion out of 7.8 billion. Right? So yeah. you could say, once upon a time, you could say it's because people are not educated. Well, today we have so many educated people. So the, the, the after SISPI, which is investing, and the last part of the SISPIP model is preservation. How do you preserve all of your assets? For example, if I die, my wife dies, everything goes to my daughter. But if my daughter has, let's just say my daughter is 18 years of age and she's got some douchebag boyfriend, they move in together. Who's got my assets now? Him. So not only is it about protecting your assets, it's about making sure that your assets remain in the bloodline. And this is the stuff they don't teach you at school. The rich people know this. The rich people, when they sit down with their children, you see, middle-class people sit down with their children. They're talking about Sachin Tendulkar. They're talking about cricket. They're talking about Salman Khan. Rich people sit down and they're building about, okay, we've got this business, we've got this brand, we've got this property, we've got this, we've got this asset, that, let's, let's build it, children. No wonder the rich keep getting richer and richer. The poor are also getting richer now because for the first time in the history of the world, the poor have access to opportunities that they didn't have before, but the middle class is getting poorer because the middle class became lazy, entitled, and they convinced themselves that they've got education when clearly that's not the case. I mean, how can, if you're so many people educated, then how come 4 billion people have a less, net worth of less than $1,000? How come? And how come the number of millionaires across the world is less than half a percent? Not that a millionaire is even a lot of money today. Today, if you're a millionaire, it's not even a big deal. Okay. Right? So even then, even though it's not a big deal, not even 1% of people get there. So the problem is huge. And the worst part is this, without, every time I talk about money and wealth, I always get at least a few people and they go, oh, but it's not all about money and it's all not about wealth. Dude, you can say that to me once you've secured your financial future. Right. Those you are the are, people. You are, yeah. Yeah. So those are the people the who world, haven't secured wealth, enough wealth. And that's why they say these things. They're justifying their limitations, right? right. So rather than saying, exactly. I want to learn, they're getting defensive. And Absolutely. you know what? And they're, and they're the same people who are going to depend on the family when they have run out of money. They're the same people who are going to ask the government for money. Right. And right now, they're all very righteous saying, oh, money is not important. Money is not important. Okay. 
money is not important, then you better not ask your family and the government for money when you run out. Dang. Dang. So there's a massive, there's a massive, there's massive hypocrisy and double standards with money. And that's another issue that I'm trying to rectify is people's belief system around money. Mm-hmm. Like what the hell are we here in 2021 and people are still talking like this, you know, and they have no problems in, in falling back on their children when they retire. So that's okay. That's completely honorable, mm-hmm. but it's completely dishonorable to become financially responsible. Like you, you see the way society thinks you look at the level of indoctrination and this is why, you know, I, I read a lot of books from a lot of great writers. One of my favorite writers being George Bernard Shaw. And George Bernard Shaw has a saying, when everyone's thinking the same, no one is thinking. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what's happened. Powerful. Powerful. You know, I, uh, I've i also read this quote that really touched me. This was about money. Money might not bring happiness, but the absence of it does bring unhappiness. And that was so powerful that... You're right. People justify their actions. Now, Ron. Yes. In one of your chapters in the book, the chapter is named as Build Indestructible Self-Confidence. Can you put some light, explain that a bit? Like how can one build indestructible self-confidence? Look, I've shared a number of tactics that will Mm -hmm. allow people to frame certain situations. For example, one of the things I've learned through spirituality is that there is no such thing as bad. Mm -hmm. Things happen to us, we think, we label it as bad. Oh, this is a bad situation. What we don't realize is with every event that we classify and categorize as bad, there is always an upside. There is always a positive attached to it. And in the same way, everything that we classify as positive always has a bad side to it. So the universe has a funny thing of producing this duality in the world. You know, when you become very successful, you might think this is good, but is it? there's usually a bad that comes with it. More responsibility, more pressure, more litigation, less people you can trust, right? So everything has a good and bad attached together. What unfortunately we tend to do is because our minds are not trained properly, we focus only on the bad and we call it bad. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize that pretty much all of our growth happens through pain. That's why I recently did a video about the fact that pain is good. But indestructible confidence also comes from knowing who you are. For example, if you know exactly who you are and what makes you unique in the world, you're not going to be compromising on your values because you don't doubt yourself anymore. You understand who you are and you understand why you're doing what you're doing. It's when we don't understand who we are and we don't understand why we're doing what we're doing that we have so much self-doubt and it's so easy for somebody to come and make a comment or a remark and completely derail us from what we were doing. You can't derail me. No matter what you say to me, I've done so much inner work on myself. You can't derail me because not because I'm arrogant, not because I'm fake, but because I know who I am. You can't derail me. You can call me all sorts of names and I've been called all sorts of names. I've been attacked, criticized, hated. I even had somebody say you belong in a dog food can. But you know what? It doesn't affect me at all. It just bounces back off me because I know who I am. I know why I'm here and I will know what I'm doing. And this is the power of self-education. Imagine, Vidan, you knew exactly what your purpose in life was. You knew exactly what your passion was. You also knew what makes you unique. Imagine you knew what your primary values are. Imagine you knew your zone of genius and your strengths. And then you set goals in alignment with all of that. Right? So this is if you live that way, you will have undestructible confidence. No one will be able to break you, shake you. No one's going to be able to penetrate you because you know who you are. Right. And this is the quality of leaders I've seen as well. I thought when I, you know, you look at a documentary of Gandhi, you look at, they're undeterred. You can beat them, imprison them, warn them. No difference. They are still as convicted about what they want to do, no matter what you threaten them with. But the average person is so weak in their conviction that all it takes is a friend's opinion and it derails them. Mm-hmm. We are so weak. Our in- inner character is so weak because we don't develop it. Right. You see, character is not something you're born with. You have to develop it over a period of time. I had no character when I was young and I used to get derailed easily. All it took was somebody's opinion and I would stop doing it. 
And I remember this happening with my first book, my first book, Eight Wealth Habits of Financially Successful People. I had done so much inner work on myself. And yet one friend said to me, oh, you're going to be a big shot now. You're going to be a big author now. And I stopped writing my book for six weeks. What? It affected me that much. And I realized all of this work I've done on myself, I'm still weak charactered, right? It takes time. And you can, but you can over a period of time build this indestructible interior. And then it's very hard to penetrate you mm -hmm. because you are flexible about other things, but you are not, you are stubborn about your own goals. You are stubborn right. about your purpose. Right. And that, what happens is and in any human society, in any organization, in any team, the person who is the most convicted, the most assured about who they are, and the most assured about what they're doing is the person that everybody gravitates towards. And that person is automatically elevated to the ranks of leadership because they seem to be a pillar of strength in a world where majority of people are completely lost and confused about who they are. That's, that's why so all... But that's why even in Greece, they used to say, in Delphi, Greece, to, you know, in 2000 years ago, they used to say that it's all wisdom starts with knowing thyself. Hmm. There is no wisdom without unless you know yourself. You can do all the tactical stuff. Ron, I'm going to learn how to be confident. I'll know how to wear nice cologne, nice clothes. I'll wear designer clothes. I'll know how to shake hands, make eye contact. But you know what? Internally, if you don't know who you are, none of that's going to work. Right. And for young men, because I run the successful male, I get a lot of young men reaching out and saying, you know, how do I find my ideal girlfriend? Or how do I get women to date, go on a date? And I said, women are very intuitive. Women always like a man who is sure about who he is. And they can feel it, they can sense it, and they can also sense when you're not sure about yourself. Well, you can go to the gym. Me. It's true. You can go to the gym, you can put on the Hugo Boss aftershave, you can wear the nice watches. But if internally you're disconnected, none of it will help. If internally you are pretty connected, aligned, then you wear, on, wear the Hugo Boss aftershave, you wear a nice watch, you wear a nice jacket. Now you've got the inside and outside completely aligned. You become a magnet. You become so charismatic naturally. See, but you can't buy that. You can't fix that problem by just going to the gym when internally you have self-doubt. That's why you got to start with knowing yourself. Right. So everything boils down to the question, answering the question, who am I? It's almost like when somebody else says, oh, Vidhan, you're smart. Oh, Ron, you're brilliant. And when we associate others' opinion with ourselves that, oh, I am smart. I am successful. And the same person, when we associate their uh, opinions of ourselves with our own opinion of ourselves, that's when others become our masters. When the same person or anybody else says, oh, you're selfish, oh, you're unsuccessful, oh, you are greedy or someone like that, then we also take it to our heart and we associate I Very with true. that as well. I am Very greedy. true. That's why I don't have the highs and lows. So you might right. say, Ron, you're amazing. You're, getting, you know, you're doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you so much for the compliment. I like right. it, but I'm over right. it now. Two minutes later, right. I'm over it. I'm on a mission. Same thing if you say, Ron, you're an idiot. You have no idea. You're an ignorant fool. No problem. I will take it on board. Two minutes later, I've forgotten it. Both ways, I'm not allowing somebody else to dictate my identity. I'm not going to get fascinated by the compliments and get flattered by it to the point that I lose my sense of reality. At the same time, I'm not going to be so discouraged by somebody's negative opinions of me because I want to be real at all times. Yeah. Right. And that is the character we need. We don't want to get because otherwise you can get swayed. Imagine you become a leader and you have somebody flattering you all the time. You know what? It takes us away from our mission. The, the mission is more important than me. I am the vehicle through which it's going to happen. I must not become arrogant and egotistical about the fact that I have developed certain gifts or those gifts have been given to me. I must use them for a bigger, for bigger purpose rather than just serving myself. Now, I'm not saying I don't serve myself. Of course, I sell, I market, I promote in every single way. I also serve myself and my family, but I first find a way to serve others and then I serve others to serve me. I also know how to serve myself without serving others, but I choose not to do that. That's so insightful, John. So now we will come down towards the very last section of our conversation of our podcast episode, which is called the fiery five. These are the last five quick questions. And uh, so let's directly dive into the first question for you. So Ron, if you were given an opportunity 
to create one law that every person in the world had to follow what would that law be that everybody has to do personal development otherwise they don't get paid uh uh-huh. interesting is by reading books and things like it yeah by reading books mentoring reflection reflection all of these sorts of things um absolutely i would i would make it absolutely mandatory in fact i spoke to my wife about it i would say i said to people you would not get tax breaks you would not get to go on a holiday if you did until you do personal development because it would benefit them and it would benefit their families right perfect uh what is the book or books you have given the most as gift to other people or what are one of the three books that have greatly influenced you in your lives what are the top three books i think the first one would be as a man think it by james allen james allen uh, i have gifted that and i've recommended it to many many people wow um i'm just trying to think what other books have impacted me a lot uh i am currently reading the book sapiens oh which you is will a, know it's a wonderful book yeah wonderful. So sapiens is a, is a wonderful book and i'm just looking at my some of the books that i have around me um yeah. just thinking what's the third book that i could recommend uh deep work deep work deep carl work. newport yes my like carl newport yeah which carl is newport. i think especially today it's become a, a pretty a, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a superpower today if you can do deep work because so many Absolutely people have lost their ability to do it right and we constantly lose it again so we have to maintain that ability to focus right wonderful uh, love super those power today love those yeah. three book recommendations everyone who is listening to it must buy these books get them so the third question to you would be ron if you had a massive giant gigantic billboard with you that uh, could read a phrase or two lines that everyone in the world could see millions and billions mm-hmm. of people could see that what would that gigantic billboard read i'm just going to go into my twitter account where i put these two liners all the time and let me see what i'll pick one of my favorite ones that i recently i would probably say choose to focus more on your purpose than your circumstances wow lovely choose to focus more on your purpose than your circumstances that people don't even realize how easily they get sucked into their circumstances oh but what about this over the economy but what about donald trump what about modi what about my parents what focus on your purpose more than you focus on your circumstances and see how your life will change powerful so powerful so what is the best what is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you have made in your life it could be investment of your time of your money anything i think i mean the best investment as as benjamin franklin said is the investment you made make in yourself i think the far the best and i can tell you these are the three best investments mastery of myself mastery of business and financial fundamentals and mastery of spiritual laws when i say mastery of spiritual laws am i a master no but i'm working towards it uh, an understanding of our energetic nature the supernatural the paranormal the metaphysical which goes beyond the physical world that we identify with through our sensory factors has given me such a profound understanding of the human condition you know we are led to believe that we are a mind and a body but we're also a heart and a spirit but what does it actually mean what does it actually mean and i have always this is something an observation i have made the more you identify yourself as a mind and a body the more struggles you have in life, in your life the more you start to understand the energetic nature of your spirit and your heart the more you're able to do things that will astonish you wow wow so that's wow. been my best investment you you've got such great clarity around things ron i love your perspective and i'm loving this conversation and loving seeing the world through your lenses for a brief moment of time and uh, would definitely love to put on these lenses for a prolonged period in my life i think you already are vidan you are already and the thing is if i knew half of what you know one tenth of what you know now at your age i mean where would i be ignorance till the age of 31 you know such massive ignorance so you are miles and miles and miles ahead but you know what to whom has been given more is expected more and the thing is with all the wisdom that you have acquired over the years and you started this mission right this was your initiative you said i'm going yeah. to make some change i want the 20 year old 
uh, generation to learn some new stuff. This was your initiative. You were resourceful enough to bring this together. You orchestrated the technology, the guests, and everything that you needed to do. So now you have acquired so much wisdom already. At your age, you know more than your last 10 ge generations probably knew put together. Question that now is what are you going to do good. with it? Yeah. yeah but, it's, but you've, got, you've, you've got a massive responsibility ahead of you. And, uh, you know, I see somebody like you and all I see is a, is a global leader. I see somebody who is going to shift things. And you have what it takes, but you have to, it's like a seed. The way I, I explain it to people is I said, look, you've got the seed. That's why you, you're seeking out this information. A lot of people are not seeking out this information. They're happy to just watch cricket and watch movies and watch and listen to music. So you have obviously got the seed of curiosity. So that seed was planted for a reason. You didn't plant it. It was there. You have now discovered the seed. Now for that seed to grow into a tree, you have to nurture that seed. You have to give it water and you have to give it sunshine. If you right. don't, the seed doesn't grow. But you've got the seed be done. Thank you so much, Ron. That's really empowering for me to hear it from you. Now we'll quickly come up to the fifth question, which is, Ron, we often go through failures in our lives. And I know we are a bit stretched out of the time that you had. And I really thank you for being uh, still here. So uh, we go through failures in our lives. And when we go through those failures, apparently they seem like major dips in our lives. And like, we don't seem to understand what, uh, why we are here now, but as time unfolds and when we look back at the same failure, it could be the, it most likely is one of the game changing uh, moments of our lives. So similarly, what is one of your best failures? What, uh, what is your favorite failure you've had in your life? That seemed like, a, that led you to success. Oh my God, we just, I just fail at everything practically when I start. I don't think anything works for us. If people knew how difficult my life has been and how much difficulty we go through with absolutely everything in business, uh, people, I don't think people could cope with, uh, you know, and I don't say this to say that I'm, I'm a very tough guy, but I don't think most people will be able to cope with one tenth of the challenges we face. Mm. What has helped me tremendously is to reframe that. I've always seen now, uh, people talk about it, but I actually see those setbacks as temporary and stepping stones for the next, next level of success. Right. What is my biggest failure? Or your best failure? <clears throat> <sighs> so many to name. Look, I wish, I wish I had, one of my biggest failures was my first business, um, which failed, it was a training company. And it happened because, and I had to wind up that company. And whilst every other company I've had failures and we've been able to recover and build, I attribute my failure to not mastering business fundamentals and assuming that because I'm good at something, I will naturally be able to go be good at that thing in business as well. I never realized that business was an entire skill set in itself, made up of 18 skills, which now I've learned. Uh, so that was probably my biggest failure, but it was a profound lesson because after that, I became hell-bent upon learning the fundamentals of principle, understanding how business works and the complexity of it. And then since then, we've been able to now literally be able to take a concept and be able to build a business fast without any capital, without any borrowings, uh, you know, uh, by doing it ourselves. So I think my biggest failure has been in business. And I can tell you there is no character building exercise than building your own business. It is the you anyone now sometimes I question is this even worth it and then I always say it was worth it it was all you look back and you say it was worth it but business is tough I think it's a wonderful opportunity and I wish that I had had some support some mentorship early on in my life because my one of my biggest regrets is what could I have done you know and people say don't have any regrets but because I'm so achievement orientated the question in my mind always is, what could I have done if I had come across this, the right wisdom and the right mentors in my 20s instead of my 30s? You know, the compound effect of that would have been, where would I be? And I do feel a regret because I'm 43. You know, you're getting old. You're starting to see the time's kick, ticking away. And the entire human lifespan from birth to the age of 80, which is the average life expectancy, most people will not even live to 80, is only 4,000 weeks. Mm -hmm. That's an entire human lifetime to think that I'm 43 and I've lived more than half. 
but possibly if you have had mentors in your 20s you wouldn't have been mentoring the people you wouldn't have the zeal to educate and empower other people 100%. because so it it's we are lucky that uh, you didn't get your mentors uh, that's a selfish perspective but probably that's going to be something really fulfilling for you going down the lane right but imagine where you would be at 43 with I... imagine where you would be at 43 right like you i mean i you should in comparison to where you are at 43 my achievements and accomplishments should be dwarfed in comparison to what you're able to accomplish simply because you have had the opportunity to get the wisdom through all the people that you are interviewing okay. and the fact that you already have the insight to know that this is what you you should be going down so you know what i would love to keep in touch and witness your success and What's see uh, you know and the compound effect don't forget the compound effect everything starts off yeah. very slowly and when people don't see the visible results they give up not realizing that they've triggered the compound effect and it takes a while for it to become visible and then it grows and grows very slowly in the beginning then it picks up momentum then it picks up very rapid momentum and it gets to a point where the money and the success comes in such large increments that it can't you can't imagination can't even keep up as an example i still remember two and a half years ago i had 300 people who were following me on instagram 300 then i got to 1000 i was very very happy 1000 people believe and can appreciate what i'm putting out you know and now i see we put up we have 100 to 200 a day that's the compound effect right there it's happened with my my financial situation it's happened with my knowledge it's happened with my influence and i tell you it's, it's just an amazing secret everything starts off very slowly in the beginning and because the results are invisible you must not forget that they're on their way wow you must not forget that and if you don't change lanes and you stick with it long enough that's why i pick something that you're passionate about so when things get tough, tough you're not going to quit if you stick with it long enough you will be shocked at what life gives you back wow ron i'm truly grateful for those words for uh, being uh, you're already a mentor to me and thank you so much now uh, we uh, we uh, to everyone who is listening to it i have a bonus really good advice question for you that will come after we uh, introduce uh, after we share where we you guys can connect with ron for more such uh, wisdom more such uh, truths to connect with him and to keep in loop with his uh, profound wisdom so ron only if where, you can handle the truth only if you can handle the truth <laughs> only if you can handle the truth of course so and nonetheless if you have come so far to listening to this podcast you definitely are someone who's seeking truth and not some made up bullshit so uh, ron where can people reach out to you i think the best way is to connect with me on instagram at uh, the ron mohotra or on linkedin send me an invite let me know that you heard this podcast and i'd love to connect with you on linkedin i'm pretty active on linkedin and instagram uh, more recently twitter but they are my main platforms and if you watch if you like any of my stuff you can watch i'm putting my videos on i actually have a very powerful video on personal brand which is an interview conducted by a very intelligent lady in india that interview is going to be up on youtube by tomorrow uh on personal branding for those of you who want to build your personal brand i've really dissected as much as i could the art and science of building a personal brand but with, with, thank you for giving me the opportunity to self promote uh but i appreciate the opportunity just to be here and uh you know i i congratulate you vidhan for for putting this together and thank you for inviting me as a guest my you know my team always says to me how many people do they have in their network if you're going to do a podcast and i said it's not the number here it's the work that vidhan's doing and the people that he's targeting the young people this is the prime time if he plants the right seeds in them now they are going to get a benefit for the rest of their life and not just them they intergen the future generations as well the power of this is so amazing most people don't realize so that's why i wanted to be here and thank you for putting this together and inviting me thank you me. so much for being here ron everyone you've got to read the book books by ron uh the latest one which he has released if i'm not wrong ron is impossible to fail which was released well the la- latest one is actually no the latest one is actually which was released already a few months ago and we've just okay. starting to promote it it's called how to speak like the world's top public speakers okay how to speak it's on, it's like on, the it's on amazon india how to speak uh, like the right. world's top public speakers i did saw that as well but i didn't know that was your latest one so definitely watch it and if you are someone who wants to be successful no matter what you you've got to read the book impossible to fail he lays out some principles that are generic for success he 
uh, distorts the belief that success is different for different people. There are certain set of principles that are definitely universal. They, these are the laws and not some uh, made up things which will differ from every other person. So that's the, I'll li link down all the portals to connect with Ron. And my final question to you, Ron, would be, what would you advise to a person who is just graduated out of his college, who's a smart driven student and who is entering into the real world? What would you advise them and what advice should they ignore? Well, I would say now that the world has changed. Uh, most of us were educated uh, in a system that was a byproduct of the industrial revolution. The world has changed and go back to the words of Charles, Charles Darwin, who said, it's not the fastest or the strongest, but the most adaptable species that survive. This is the time to adapt. The world has changed. The way you think has to change. The way you educate yourself has to change. And the way you bring value to the marketplace has to change. Uh, within five to 10 years, uh, uh, you know, Jack Ma said that 800 million jobs will be lost. Artificial intelligence, automation, and outsourcing trends are going to create havoc for a lot of white collar laborers. And don't forget that uh, in the industrial revolution, blue collar workers were the laborers. In the information age, it was the white collar workers that became the laborers. So if you want to do well, you're going to have to start with self-discovery, understand and master the laws of spirituality and understand the business and financial fundamentals. And if you do these three things, you will be able to design the life and lifestyle that you want. Thank you so much. That was lovely advice for people. Thank you so much, Ron, for being here. It was lovely for us to have you, for the listeners, for me. And uh, we, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm sure I'm going to get you sometime in the future where we can dive deep into wealth creation, which I really am uh, very excited to be talking with you about. And Let's do it, Vidhan. Just put a list of questions, just created around money, wealth, psychology of money, wealth creation, all of that sort of stuff. And we can go deep dive. If you put a list of specific questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. 100%. I have a lot of questions already listed up, but I wanted this conversation to just go the way it was going. And I absolutely am amazed by it. I loved it. I'm going to go back and listen to this conversation again without a, a question you. of doubt. So thank you thank so you. much for being here, Ron. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.